In the interest of shameless puns, the goal today is a solid basis. Basis is a word that traverses too many contexts for a single instruction video. But in the accounting world, tax preparers should have an understanding of the basis rules and their role in the taxation of the prominent flow through entities, partnerships, and S corporations. Before doing any calculations, let's define a scope. Who, what, where, when, why, how. Our who. Let's take a partnership. And because I like castles, the partnership, the entity, will be this castle. Now, is the castle our who? Well, partly, but we're really considering the partners that own the entity. This is flow through taxation, so the rules might heavily concern the entity. It is the tax of partners and shareholders, the castle's royalty, that we are most concerned with. So our queens and kings, the owners of the castle, they're our who. Our what? Officially, there are too many definitions for basis. But for our purpose today, we'll say basis is the cost of an owner's investment in their property. The key is that basis changes with the ebbs and flows of the business, and we have to keep track of these changes. Let's merge our where and when into one important rule of thumb. Keep a separate basis schedule and track basis every year from day one, when the first stones are laid down. It is so much easier to calculate basis in real time than it is to go back in time to calculate. Anyone who's had to dig for old documents to do this can tell you that recovering decade-old basis information can become a real mess quickly. Why? Why do we care? And why do these basis rules exist at all? The answer lies in the nature of single-level flow-through taxation. Basis is the bridge between the entity and its owner the tool that determines the fair taxation of the owner for the activity of the business. And how? Learning the basis rules the IRS has us follow. Let's learn what they are. We're going to focus mostly today on an S corporation. The partnership rules are more expansive, but the core partnership basis rules are mostly the same as an S corp, but we'll go over some differences later. First aspect initial basis. In the formation of our S-Corp, our initial basis equals the cash we paid for it plus the adjusted basis of any contributed property. Outside of forming the corporation, a new shareholder's initial basis can also come through stock purchase, conversion from a C-Corporation, gift, or inheritance. For our example, let's say we helped form the S-Corporation Castle with $100,000 cash and contributed a drawbridge with $20,000 adjusted basis. And a little CPA exam theme note here, any fair market value information on the drawbridge is irrelevant for basis. Now that we have our initial basis, we start tracking basis over the life of the business. There are three taxation pillars I want us to keep in mind as we learn these rules. Distributions, losses, and changes in ownership. We'll come back to these pillars throughout our examples. As we head into year one of our business, we need to understand the order of basis adjustments. First, basis increases. Basis is increased by capital contributions, income, and gains. Second, basis is reduced by distributions and distributions are one of our pillars, so let's get into an example. In year one, the S-Corp Castle has $10,000 of income and the corporation makes a distribution of $150,000. So, our initial basis plus $10,000 income less $150,000 will give us a basis of negative 20,000, right? Wrong. The golden rule of basis, basis cannot be negative. So what happens? With the $10,000 income, we have a $130,000 basis and not enough to cover the $150,000 distributions. Folks, this is why distributions is a pillar. A distribution in excess of basis is a taxable gain to the taxpayer. So in this situation, we have $20,000 of taxable gain. This is one reason why it's so important to track basis to ensure distributions aren't made that result in tax. Back to our ordering rules, third is the subtraction of non-deductible expenses. We'll come back to this third step in a moment. And fourth is all other losses. 
losses. Our second pillar. Let's go back to our example. So we ended year one with zero dollar basis after the distribution causing a $20,000 capital gain. Let's say in year two we have $50,000 of capital gain and $75,000 of ordinary loss. So first we add our gain for $50,000 then deduct our losses. Remember, basis cannot go negative. So what happens to the remaining $25,000 of unused loss? Unlike distributions which result in taxable gain, the unused losses are carried forward to the next available year. Let's go up to the tower for a bird's eye view. Distributions coming before losses in the basis calculation is generally a good thing for a taxpayer. Because distributions result in taxable gain, the taxpayer would likely prefer any available basis to soak up the distribution before losses, since suspended loss is usually pre preferable to current taxable gain. Another note on ordering. There is an irrevocable election to flip steps 3 and 4 to put non-deductible expenses last in the ordering. There are some wrinkles with this election though, so we'll keep this exercise friendly and assume the default ordering. Now let's talk about character of loss. Losses maintain their character when carried forward. But what about in a situation which I have different types of loss? Which one do I need to use first? So let's say I have $10,000 in basis, and $10,000 ordinary loss, and $10,000 capital loss. Can I choose to use the more beneficial ordinary loss first? I can't. Loss is, de is deducted pro rata by the character of that loss. So I would use $5,000 ordinary and $5,000 capital against basis, and then I carry the same remaining amounts forward. Simple enough so far? Good. Now I'm going to change the rules, just a little, for a topic that is unique to S-corporations and thus does not apply to partnerships. For S-corporations, we have to consider the difference between stock and debt basis. So far, everything we've covered is our stock basis for an S-corporation. A debt basis is different. For an S-Corp, a shareholder can receive debt basis for debts made directly from the shareholder to the S-Corporation. Make sure you take note that the amount has to be owed to the shareholder. But why do we care? Well, debt basis allows a shareholder to further utilize losses, but it can only be used for losses and thus can't be used for distributions. Let's go back to our example for year three. We have no stock basis to begin the year, and $25,000 of ordinary loss carried forward from year two. In year three, we have $40,000 of capital gain, a $10,000 distribution, and another $100,000 of ordinary loss. But let's also say the shareholder loan, loaned the corporation $50,000 in year three. So stock basis always comes first. We start with $0, then add the $40,000 capital gain, take out the $10,000 distribution second. With the year two carry forward and year three loss, we have $125,000 of ordinary loss to use against just $30,000 of stock basis. So stock basis gets reduced to zero, but we still have $95,000 of loss we'd like to use. This year, we have the $50,000 owed to us from the castle, creating $50,000 in debt basis. This allows us to use an extra $50,000 of losses, reducing debt basis to zero, and now we carry forward $45,000 of ordinary loss to year four. There's a catch with using debt basis though. That $50,000 is still owed to the shareholder, but now the shareholder has no debt basis. So if the castle pays off this debt while the debt basis is zero, there will be a $50,000 gain to the shareholder. As to the character of this gain, it is ordinary and thus a higher tax rate if this debt isn't evidenced by a written note. But the gain is capital, thus a lower than ordinary tax rate if there is proper documentation. However, if there is enough increase to basis in the future, it is possible to restore debt basis, which means it might be best for the castle to wait to pay off the loan until the debt is restored to avoid tax.
Last thing on S Corps, we never address the third pillar. If there is a change in ownership, such as a sale or disposition, it is stock basis that determines gain. So taxable gain on a change in ownership is proceeds over stock basis. Okay, let's transition and hit on a few basis concepts unique to partnerships. I think we need a new castle. There we go. Is that Hogwarts? Looks like Hogwarts. So it's impossible to talk about partnership basis without touching on inside and outside basis. Inside basis is from the perspective of the partnership, from the castle itself, and is the partnership's basis and its assets. But we're more concerned with outside basis today from the perspective of the partner. Outside basis is the partner's basis in the partnership interest. So with partnership outside basis, we use many of the same concepts as we did with S Corp stock basis. As a reminder, we don't make a distinction between stock and debt basis for partnership basis. The big difference with partnership basis is in the role debt assumes. Debt has a much more expansive role in partner basis than for an S-Corp's debt basis. A partner receives basis for a partner's share in all partnership liabilities and not just debt owed the partner from the castle, as with the S-Corp. Because of this, if a forming castle is choosing between an S-Corp or partnership structure, if they are expecting significant losses early on and thus will need to borrow significant money, a partnership structure might be best so the debt would allow partners to use those losses. There's more here though. We subtract from basis any partner liabilities assumed by the partnership. Let's do one final example showing the assumption of partner liabilities and its effect on basis. Ron and Hermione are the partners making up their castle. They want to admit a third partner. Let's call him Seamus. All three will have one third ownership of the castle. Seamus contributes a whole tower to add to the castle with an adjusted tax basis of $200,000 and it has a mortgage of $150,000 assumed by the partnership. So Seamus contributed property with basis $200,000 but the associated $150,000 mortgage on this property, two thirds of this is assumed by Ron and Hermione, the other two partners in the partnership, all partners with equal ownership. Thus, Seamus' basis in the property, 200000 is reduced by the 100000 of the mortgage that is assumed. So Seamus' basis in the partnership is now $100,000. Seamus has his basis, and hopefully, now you have yours. I like castles. <laughs>